was London. The thousand German planes gathering over the French coast made a distinct impression on British radar screens. Fighter command threw everything it had into the battle. Over 300 Spitfires and Hurricanes were sent aloft to greet the weight of the German Luftwaffe. It was the climax of a long summer's struggle. The deciding moment in the Battle of Britain had finally arrived. From the moment the Germans hit British skies, they were swarmed by the RAF. As always, the Spitfires took on the fighters while the Hurricanes attacked the bombers. This monumental clash involved hundreds of pilots from both sides and soon the clear autumn sky was painted with the spiraling vapor trails of German and British fighters. Cursed with limited range, German fighters were forced to break for home after just 20 minutes fighting. In the heat of battle, many continued dogfighting only to run out of fuel over the English Channel. Without protection, the German bombers fell prey to the British. By the end of the day, 40 lay in ruins, while many more barely made it back to base. It was a decisive victory for the RAF. Goering insisted that the British could still be defeated, but Hitler no longer believed him. The invasion of England was postponed indefinitely, the RAF had won the Battle of Britain. During a BBC radio address, a relieved Prime Minister told his country, never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. RAF pilots who flew during the war came from a variety of backgrounds. Many were students, a few were engineers, and some were just sportsmen who thought their hunting skills would make them natural dogfighters. But all of them learned to fly in this, the de Havilland Tiger Moth. The two-seat Tiger Moth was the standard RAF trainer during the 30s and 40s. The students learned to fly by sitting in the front and listening to the instructor. When the aircraft reached a safe height, the student would take the stick and begin flying. When the young pilot gained the instructor's confidence, he was allowed to make his first unglamorous landing. During the early days of World War II, students only flew an average of seven hours before moving on. Britain was fighting for her life, and it needed to get its boys into the battle. Having won the Battle of Britain, the RAF could finally look beyond its home skies. The British island of Malta was a vital toehold in the Mediterranean. It lay between Mussolini's Italy and German-controlled Libya, and not surprisingly, it had been under siege since the beginning of the war. For two years, a small but valiant group of hurricane pilots managed to keep the island under British control. In November 1942, an Allied assault force came ashore in Algeria and Morocco. At the port city of Algiers, an RAF supply unit marched ashore and set up an airfield. Soon after, a squadron of hurricanes flew in from Gibraltar. The Allied goal was to envelop German forces and drive them from the continent. Standing in the way was the formidable armor of Germany's desert fox, Erwin Rommel. The RAF's hurricane, which had defended the skies over Britain, was modified to deal with Rommel's tanks. It was armed with two armor-piercing 40mm guns mounted under the wing. The hurricane squadrons were joined by American P-40 Tomahawks, given to the RAF under the provisions of Lend-Lease. The barren deserts of North Africa 
left Rommel's forces nowhere to hide. American and British pilots swarmed German convoys, driving Rommel's tanks northward. By the spring of 1943, the German army was in full retreat. As the Allied soldiers advanced towards the Mediterranean, they waded through the wreckage of the Allied air assault. By May, North Africa was under Allied control. In the skies over Europe, two old adversaries continued their struggle for air supremacy. But much had changed since the Battle of Britain. By 1941, RAF pilots were making daily sweeps over the French coast. Now it was the Germans who were on the defensive. War had matured the British airmen. Their tactics had been refined, and so had their aircraft. The Spitfire V, seen here pursuing a Spanish 109 in German markings, had become the RAF's standard fighter. The Spitfire V's greatest improvement was power. The new Merlin engine provided over 1,400 horsepower, 400 more than its predecessor. The Five was often considered the easiest to fly of all the Spitfires. In 1941, the aircraft outfought its German opponents, but its supremacy was about to be taken away. In late 1941, Germany unveiled the Focke-Wulf 190. This deadly fighter would turn the tide of the air war, once again igniting a frantic race for air superiority. The Focke-Wulf was produced in great secrecy. Even as it was turned over to the Luftwaffe, the British were still unaware that a lethal adversary was about to emerge. In September of 1940, several RAF pilots reported seeing a new German fighter. Such claims were dismissed by British intelligence. Then a Spitfire returned to base with camera gun footage showing a new German fighter with a radial engine. Soon these encounters became more common and the Royal Air Force grew all too familiar with the focke 190. The focke outclassed the Spitfire V in almost every way. It was faster and had a greater rate of climb. It could reach heights of 35,000 feet, allowing German pilots to jump the British from above. The Spitfire's only advantage was in the turn, but this was little help. During the summer of 1942, RAF pilots suffered heavy losses. Something needed to be done, fast. In England, Rolls-Royce was building a more powerful engine for their new Lancaster bomber. The supercharged 1,600 horsepower Merlin caught the attention of fighter command. The RAF asked if the new engine could be used in its fighters. The result was the Spitfire 9. The bigger Merlin engine wasn't designed for a fighter, and the Spitfire's nose had to be lengthened by 18 inches. The Spitfire 9 was produced for the RAF as a stopgap measure, keeping the focke at bay until a true replacement came along. But in searching for an interim solution, the British had found the answer to the deadly focke 190. By 1942, America was committed to the war, and the US 8th Air Force had arrived in England. While the RAF bombed Germany by night, the Americans preferred to fly during the day. RAF's fighter command was given the job of protecting American formations. Spitfire ace Johnny Johnson recalls. We liked to squat in the, 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 the 8th Air Force because the Germans reacted in strength, sometimes in gaggles of uh, 50 uh, Focke-Wolfs and uh, 190s, and we had some very uh, hectic air battles. B-17 flying fortresses bristled with gun turrets. American crews were fighting for their lives, and they had a reputation for shooting at any fighter that came close. Spitfire pilots decided to create a protective shield about a mile outside the B-17s. When a German fighter broke through, they left it to the American gunners. The 
the Spitfire's limited range meant that the RAF pilots could only escort the bombers as far as the Dutch border. For the rest